Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapo speaking. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Psalm 51, one of the key psalms of the 150 that are in the book of Psalms. And we'll be, we'll be looking at uh, three more after this one. What I'm doing is I'm taking the most important psalms from each of the separate books of the psalms. There are five altogether. So this one, Psalm 51, is extremely important because it talks about true repentance. And with the subject of true repentance comes true conversion. Because without true repentance, you cannot have true conversions. You can't just say to God, oh, I'm sorry for my sins, or I want God in my life. And some of the ways that we've been telling people how to be saved are not, uh, repentance is not involved at all. We've been, sometimes people will say, well, you need God in your life so that you can have a help and a strength. Well, that's all true. But the bottom line is that we all need to repent of our sins and trust Jesus Christ to save us and usher us into the kingdom of God. So that's really what we're looking at tonight is true repentance. And then after that, we're going to look at Psalm 51. So I'm going to ask Tom to start us off in prayer. Tom, would you pray, please? Thank you, Father, for this evening, for giving us the opportunity to come together again. Father, I pray that you that you touch Pastor Alex and what he's going to speak about tonight in such an important subject. I pray, God, that you keep us in brokenness all, all the time and, and grant us repentance because that's what we really need to be converted. And it's all from you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to start off with a video, a teaching on true repentance by a pastor by the name of Derek Smith. Derek Smith passed, uh, Derek Prince rather. Derek Prince passed a few years ago, but he was one of the great men of God in the history of the church. And he does a terrific uh, teaching on repentance. It's about 12 minutes long, and it will give us a real good foundation for what we're going to study tonight. So here's Derek Prince and true repentance. Here we go. Now, it's very important that we understand what repentance is. Repentance is not an emotion. I've seen many times preachers will seek to work people up into an emotional attitude and then call them to faith in Christ. And very, very often that leads to a letdown because they, the emotion runs out and they're left with nothing. So bear in mind, repentance, as defined in the Bible, is not an emotion. It is a decision. It doesn't spring from the emotions. It springs from the will. If we can reach people's will and turn their will, we will see permanent conversions. Many of the so-called conversions in the church today are impermanent because they have never really changed the will of the person. They've had an emotional experience, they've got excited, maybe they've felt wonderful for a few weeks or months or even years, but in the end they don't have what it takes to go through because their will has not been touched. Now you know there are two main languages of the Bible, Greek of the New Testament and Hebrew of the Old, and each of those languages has a specific word for repent. But only if we put the two languages together do we get the full meaning of repentance. The Greek word in secular language is always translated to change your mind, to change the way you think. So first of all, repentance is changing your mind about the way you've been living. I've been living to please myself, to do my own thing, from now on, I'm going to live to please Jesus, my Savior. It's a decision. As I've said before, it is not an emotion. You can repent without any obvious emotion, but you cannot repent without a change of your will. And then the Hebrew word, and this is so typical of the Jewish people because they're a very down-to-earth people. They want to know, well, what does it work out at? And the Hebrew word for repent means literally to turn around. You've been facing one way, the wrong way, with your back to God, 
you turn 180 degrees, face toward God and say, God, here I am, tell me what to do and I'll do it. So you put the two together and you have a complete picture of repentance. And faith comes only after repentance. The whole message of the Bible is in this order, repent and believe. There are lots of people, and some of them are here this morning, who are struggling for faith. The truth is, you're not struggling for faith. You've never met the condition of repentance. You see, it's the first of the six foundation doctrines. And if you don't have that foundation stone in place, your building will always be wobbly. I have counseled over the years hundreds of people, hundreds of Christians, who've come with their personal problems. And after a, a lot of experience, I came to this conclusion. At least 50% of the problems of professing Christians or real Christians are due to one fact. They have never truly repented. They have never really changed their mind. They've never really made a decision. They've never really surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus in their lives. They're still thinking about decisions from this point of view. Now, if I do this, what will it do for me? And if I do that, what will it do for me? When you've repented, that's not the way you think. You think, if I do this, will it glorify Jesus? If I do that, will it glorify Jesus? And so we have multitudes of people, I think especially young people, but not only young people, who are double-minded. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He doesn't have a solid foundation. He doesn't, he can't produce a stable building. So I invite you just where you are right now, quietly to reflect for a few moments and ask yourself, have I ever really truly repented? Or am I still double-minded? On Monday, my aim is to please Jesus. On Tuesday, my aim is to please myself. You see, you've got the worst of both worlds, actually. You'd be better off just living in the world, living for yourself. Because you're a double-minded person, you're a split personality. Now we have to go on with the nature of repentance. There is one parable that Jesus told, which is the most vivid and perfect illustration of true repentance. It's the parable of what we call the prodigal son, though somebody else has said it should be called the caring father. You remember the story in Luke 15, most of you know it. The second son of a wealthy family decided to get all his inheritance from his father right now and went off to a distant, distant country and lived it up. He did, he spent, he did all sorts of sinful things and then when he'd spent his whole inheritance, a famine came. And the only job he could get was feeding pigs. And you have to remember he was Jewish. So for him to feed pigs was just as low as he could come. Without One of the great challenges in this world is knowing enough about a subject. Okay, that's about it. I think we got the idea. It's an excellent video. I really like that teaching. So we're talking about true repentance. We have a lot to cover. And uh, when I do ask questions, I'm just going to take one answer, maybe two at the most. So just prepare yourselves for that because we need to move very quickly through the material because there's lots of it. So let's begin with understanding what repentance is. And you'll see a lot of the stuff that was mentioned in that video, I will be mentioning in the Bible study. So what does it mean to repent? Well, this is the definition from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Repent is to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. To repent is to feel regret or contrition. To repent is to change one's mind. Now the word repent means to cause to feel regret or contrition, or to feel sorrow, regret, or contrition for a particular sin or a particular vice. This picture down here depicts the difference between a man who is not repentant and a man who is. This is the story that Jesus told of the Pharisee and the tax collector. 
Pharisees were the religious leaders of the time of Jesus, and tax collectors were the most hated individuals in Jewish society because they worked for the Romans collecting taxes from the people. And oftentimes they were pretty corrupt because they would collect taxes more than they were supposed to, and they would pocket the excess. Now, both these men went into the temple to pray, and you can see here Jesus is observing them both. This man here, the Pharisee, the religious leader, prayed, I'm glad I'm not like other men. I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector beside me. I read the word of God. I give to the poor. I tithe everything that I have. And he went through all of his check marks of how religious he was and how good he was. This man came into the temple, but he couldn't even lift his face towards God because he was filled with shame and guilt. He got down on his face and his prayer was, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, this man went home justified. And this man was still in his sin because it's not performance that makes you right with God. It's repentance that makes you right with God. An admission of your sin and a resolve to turn your life around. Another illustration of repentance is here in this little diagram here. You can see that it's a complete 180 turn, 180 degree turn from the life that you are living. So you may have been living without God, no interest in God, no thought that you might be a sinner, no honor for God for being your creator, no uh, knowledge at all that Jesus died for your sins. And all of a sudden here, at a point in your life, you hear the gospel, you respond to it, and you would commit your life to Jesus and ask forgiveness for your sins. The Holy Spirit causes you to be born again, and your life completely turns around. And now Jesus is at the center of your life. Pleasing God is the cornerstone and the foundation of everything that you do. So it's a complete 180 degree turn from where you are living. Strong's Concordance gives us the original Greek word for repent from the original Greek Bible, which is metanoo, metanoe, no, metanoeo, that's it, metanoeo. And metanoeo means to change one's mind or purpose. The usage is I repent, I change my mind, I change or I ask God to change the inner man and I pray to God to be accepted by his will, which is only through Jesus Christ. So what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change in action. It's not just feeling sorry for your sins. It's not just saying, oh, I need God in my life. But it's a recognition that you are a sinner separated from God. And if you have any conviction that you need him in your life, that's great. But first, you have to put aside the thing that separates you from him, which is your sin. So this change involves both a turning from sin and a turning towards God. And he does the rest through what Jesus did on the cross. The Holy Spirit applies the death and resurrection of Jesus to your life and you are saved. Now, what does it take to repent? That's very interesting. What I did was I took individual verses on repentance, which tell us each one what it takes to repent, what's necessary in true repentance. So let's start with 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, and I'll be asking you why this characteristic is important in repentance. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their land. So when I read that verse, it shows me that humility, humility is necessary for repentance. Can somebody tell me why humility is necessary for repentance? Anyone? Because God rejects the proud, so you can't come close to God if you come with a prideful heart. Okay, that's a good answer. Yes. Anything else? Why is humility necessary for repentance, for true repentance? I think just following with Caroline's point in that if you have pride in your heart, you can't come to a place where you you can admit that you're, you're wrong and then turn from what you've been doing. Okay. What is the reason why we would turn from sin and uh, from the wrong that we're doing? We recognize something about God and his authority over our lives. What is it that we recognize? We're seeking God's purpose and not our own. Yeah, okay, seeking God's purpose. Well, what do we recognize about God in relation to us when we repent? He's that he's charge. Lord. That he's Lord. Who said that? He's Lord? Me, Caroline, sorry. Okay, so that he's Lord, yeah. 
humble yourself before the Lord is acknowledging his lordship. Now, there's a teaching going around that you can accept Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. And that's hogwash. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. You ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, and then you live as the Lord of your life. Makes no sense. Because when you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you are at the same time asking him to take over lordship of your life. And you are submitting to his will and not your own from that moment on. All right, let's take a look at what else it takes to repent. Now, this one comes from 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us or to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I read that verse, it shows me that honesty is an important element in repentance. Honesty. Why is honesty important in repentance? Somebody. Anyone. God despises liars. Okay. Well, how could I uh, tell me, give me an example of how I could lie to God. About my sin, that is. Christina. Uh, off the top of my head. Um, well, God, I'm not going all the way. And I love this guy. So it's okay, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Is that like a lie? Is that kind of like a lie? <laughs> Very interesting example. <laughs> Lying to God, trying to hide. I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's hope it's not a personal testimony. Oh, anyway. <laughs> Okay. Does it work? Right. I don't know. So honesty, honesty about your sins. Don't go before God and try to cover up. Don't go to be before to God and give a bunch of excuses. Don't go to God and talk about, oh, you know, I'm weak, Lord Jesus. Please understand. You know my heart. Just confess your sin for what it is. Because if you confess your sin, if you're honest about your sin, if you're not trying to hide it or water it down or sugarcoat it, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So uh, we need honesty in when we truly repent. Honesty is important. So, so far the, we, yes. How about the confession part? Because that is the important part of it first is to confess that you did do wrong. Yeah. And the repentance is telling what you did do wrong and, and being sorry for it. That's it. Okay. And let's move on. That's right. So that involves honesty as well. Okay. Thank you. Let me move that over. The next one comes from Acts 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent then and turn to God. That's the line that really impressed me because I realized that in true repentance, even if I truly repent, apart from God's grace, I cannot receive forgiveness. So I'm going to ask Tom to explain that to me. What is God's grace what is his involvement in repentance? How does God's gr grace apply to our lives when we truly repent, Tom? He, uh, he forgives us completely yeah. of our sins. And uh, that's thanks to Jesus and the cross. Yeah, so without him, there's, there's no chance, right? There's, there's no hope, no. Yeah, there's no hope even, even to come to him without him, I think. Exactly. Yeah, so that's what it means. We need God's grace. Because without, without God's grace, we wouldn't even think about repenting. We would just go on with our merry way. So the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the activity of the Holy Spirit is very important. Does anybody else have anything to say about God's grace and the necessity of God's grace in repentance? Anyone before I move on? Yeah, the only addition I wanted to make to that is the interesting that the operative word there is refreshing. Yeah, the refreshing okay. will come to you. And that really sounds like a release and a relief and, a, you know, a, a joy uh, you know, a sense of fulfillment will come to you. That's what, uh, that's what I'm thinking anyway. And, and that's another, uh, I guess, um, uh, result of, uh, of grace uh, being applied, you know, to a situation. Okay. Yeah, that's true. When your sins are forgiven and you know that God has accepted you and he's wiped away the penalty of your sins, there is a release and there is a refreshing and there is a great joy. I'm just wondering if you just show me by your reactions, your thumbs up, how many of you felt that release when you committed your life to the Lord Jesus? I certainly did. Anyone else? The release from sin. That's very important. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, that's great. Thank you. We'll move on. What else is involved in repentance? Well, let's see. The next one comes from Proverbs 28, verse 13. Ah, here's what Beverly was saying, I believe. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever confesses their sins 
or I'm sorry, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So transparency is important in true repentance. Can somebody tell me why that is? Transparency. What is transparency? Non-pretentious. Non-pretentious. Okay. Anything else? Honesty. Honesty and transparency definitely do go together. Yeah. Anything else? Well, just going back to what he was saying, the pastor not being double-minded. Not being double-minded. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Anything else? One more before we move on. Well, it's a, a being a... Of mine. Okay. You have Miss, uh, Sister Bev and then Caroline. No, I said it, it's, you have to have a complete change of mind to be able to um, to do all the stuff that is going to glorify him. And if you don't have a change of mind, you will not be successful in glorifying him. Okay, thank you. And Caroline? When I think of transparency, I think about you know people coming to Jesus, people coming into the light. And Jesus is always exposing things that are in our hearts. And um, it there is a protection in transparency because the more that we're transparent, the, the less we're going to sin because we don't have anything to hide. Whereas when people have a, a sinful heart, they want to be in the darkness. They want to hide what, what sin they're dealing with, uh, or rather they'd rather hide it so that they don't have to deal with it. So from the very beginning, even with salvation, God calls us to be transparent and, and it's something that has to continue on into our uh, walk with him. Okay. What about transparency with one another? Is that important as well? Transparency between brothers and sisters. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, he even says confess your sins to each other. Ah, there you are. Okay. So uh, I think for the most part that uh, it's very difficult to be transparent with others because you're afraid of what they might do with your secrets, with your dark areas, with your mm -hmm. secret sins. And uh, you find uh, when you when you're when you live out the Christian life and you deal with people that some people can't be trusted with your secrets. However, if you have nothing to hide and you've been forgiven of your sins, what difference does it make if they know about it? It doesn't make any difference to me. When I give my testimony, I give my, um, my testimony of what I was before I committed my life to Christ. I don't hide anything. And to this day, I still don't hide anything. I'll talk about my fears. I'll talk about my pessimism. I'll talk about my mental anguish. I talk about my visits to the psychiatrist, I'll talk about uh, worshiping dead bodies, uh, all the stuff that I did before. I don't care if anybody knows about it. That, that doesn't matter to me because that Alex Lapos is dead. So what have I got to hide? And it would be even more foolish to try to hide that from God because everything that I did in my past life, all the sins I committed, he was there to see them all anyway. So, <laughs> so why hide it from him? Now, in, this, in the context of fellowship with one another, if we're looking to our brothers and sisters to support us during a time of weakness or to support us when we're struggling with a sin or support us in just walking with God, we're not going to get very far if we're not honest with our brothers and sisters and we're not transparent with them. So uh, I think it's better to take the risk of transparency with our brothers and sisters rather than hide. Because if you're hiding, if you're holding on to something, if you're trying to conceal something, how can you form meaningful relationships? There's always something missing. So transparency is very important in, uh, in repentance because uh, it does affect personal relationship. And that includes your personal relationship with God. Moving on. Matthew 3.8 says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Oh, this is a biggie. This is a biggie. I wish there was more preaching on this. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. True repentance involves a change of life, a change of thought, a change of action, and a change of attitude towards God. So can somebody tell me what changes happen when we truly repent as far as our relationship with God goes? Anyone? What changes does Jesus make after you commit your life to him? I'll he give gives you us a new heart. He gives us a new heart. Okay, let's elaborate on that in more detail. How does a new heart display itself like for example i'll give you one before i got saved i didn't care very much about jesus didn't know much about him 
Uh, I didn't know anything about him being the center of my life. After I committed my life to him, he was everything. He was my life, my breath, my source, my strength, my guide, everything, all of a sudden. That was a big change. Anything else? Maybe more specific. What changes when you commit your life to Jesus? Your thoughts well, I change. Found, yes, I found ahead. that if you, um, the more that you love Jesus, the more you're going to trust him. So when he, you're reading the Bible and you're spending time with him and you see something in there, you're more willing to actually do what he's asking of you in the word. So that is a big change in the heart because usually we're rebelling against the word and now we're more willing to actually follow it. Okay, that's a good answer. Thank you very much. So change of life is important. And if there is no change of life, if there is no change at all, has true repentance taken place? Yes or no? No. 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 <laughs> no. There it's has very, to be. Yeah. So right. it's very hard to show other people the changes that you have gone through if you've got nothing to show it in the first place. That's what I'm saying. But unfortunately, with the preaching of today, you can go to church and have no change in your life and claim that you've repented and you've committed your life to Christ and no fruit in your life at all. But according to the word of God, if there's nothing to show for your faith in Jesus, if there's not been a change, you haven't really repented. You've just deceived yourself. All right, let's see what else is involved in true repentance. Is there anything else? Yes, there's one more. Second Chronicles 30, verse 9b. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassion, uh, compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Another important element of true repentance is trust. Can someone explain that to me? Why is trust important in repentance? Anyone? He will not turn his face from you if you come to him. Well, trust is a part of um, faith. And so the more that you have faith in what he is saying, the more you're going to be trusting him. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Someone else? Davis, what about you? Why is trust important in repentance? Uh, because without it, you can't uh, really function. Like once you repent, you believe, okay, I'm submitting to God and he's going to forgive me and I trust him to lead me on. So is a process of, uh, is a continuous process of trusting in him, even after you have repented, right? right? So I think it's more important during and after. So. All right, very good. I've got to know, if I'm going to give, give my life to Jesus, I've got to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that asking him to come into my life will forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future, that the Holy Spirit really will come and live in me, and that I will be empowered to live for God after that. I have to know that. Otherwise, I might be reluctant to do it. I know when I got saved, those three things were very important to me. I had to know that this was not something that I do on my own. That if I commit my life to Jesus, he will be there and all of the promises that he made about receiving me, forgiving my sins, empowering me, coming to live in me are all true. So there had to be a trust there. And there still has to be a trust. Because I know some Christians to this day are struggling. Oh, am I saved or am I not saved? They don't know. Why would they not know? The word of God makes it very clear that if you trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, you are saved. And that should produce a change of life. If that change of life is not there, well, then I can understand their doubt. I think I mentioned that on Sunday, that some people look into their lives and they don't see any evidence of the fruit that Jesus talks about. So they doubt their salvation. Well, they need to maybe reevaluate or just maybe read the word of God over again and stop beating up on themselves. But yeah, trust is a very important element of true repentance. I think I have one more. Let's see. Oh, yes. James 4. Uh, sorry. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Urgency is important in repentance. Why is that? Urgency. Anybody? What, is, what does urgency mean? Because you don't know how long you have to live. That's exactly right. You don't know how long you have to live. You don't know if you're going to get another opportunity. So when you're presented with the gospel and the opportunity to repent and receive Christ as your savior, don't wait till next week. Don't put it off. Don't window shop and 
wait and see if this is for you or not. If you've heard the word, receive the word. Don't waste your time because tomorrow you may not be here. Nobody has any guarantee of living out the fullness of their lives. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. The moment that you hear it, don't put it off for another time. And uh, I can't even, I, I don't think I could count the number of people that have missed out on God because they took their time committing their life to Jesus. So they spent way too much time browsing and not buying, if you want to put it that way. All right, so urgency is very important. And the last one is resolve. James 4, verse 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Resolve is important in repentance, true repentance. Why is resolve important? Anyone, what is resolve? Why is resolve important? Resolve means I'm going to do this. That's it. Nothing can stop me. So why is resolve important? Because there's a battle for our soul and we're going to be faced with all kinds of hardships and temptations. And if we haven't made up our mind that we're going to follow Christ and that we're not going to let anything deter us and that we're not going to quit on our faith, um, then we've already lost the battle if we haven't made up our minds from the beginning. That's right. Urgency and resolve and making a decision. You remember Derek Prince said that repentance is a decision? Well, that kind of ties in with resolve. You decide, I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't care what my friends think. I don't care what kind of embarrassment, embarrassment or conflict or adversity it might bring me. I know it's the truth. I'm committing myself to him and that's it. And nothing can stop me. And I'm going to live my life out for him. So there has to be resolve and true repentance. All right. Well, having seen all that, we're ready to look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51 was written by David. Let me tell you a little bit of the background of what happened to David and why he wrote this psalm. Some of you know the story, but some of you may not. King David was a man after God's own heart. He was a righteous man. The spirit of God was upon him. It was not living in him like it does with us because we we're still in the Old Testament and Jesus had not died on the cross and risen from the dead to give the spirit yet. But yet, if you were righteous and if you had a heart for God, the spirit would be with you at least. So anyway, one day he was supposed to go to war. As a king, he was supposed to lead his armies to war. But he decided one season of war to take, the, take some time off and go walking on top of his roof. And while he was walking on top of his roof, he looked through a window and saw a woman naked bathing. And it happened to be the wife of one of his most trusted soldiers. Uriah the Hittite. Uriah had been faithful to David all of his life. Uriah was one of David's 30 most trusted soldiers, 30 of David's most trusted companions, and had been with David even before he was crowned king while he was on the run from King Saul who was out to kill him. Well, now David was king and he was head of the army. Uriah was sent to fight and David called Bathsheba, his wife who was bathing, into his quarters and had illicit sex with her, and she became pregnant. And uh, he was just going to cover it up and move on. He had his, her husband murdered so that he could justify his sin. Well, Nathan the prophet showed up and told David that he was in, in the wrong and that he needed to repent. And uh, David was absolutely brokenhearted because up until that time, he was trying to cover it up. But now it was right in his face, and he had no choice but to repent or die. You know, it was, that was the choice that was presented to him. So to repent from this sin that he had committed with Bathsheba and the murder that he committed by taking her husband away, he wrote this. Have mercy. I'll read the whole psalm and then we'll break it down. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. I have done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me no wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. That was the song that we played at the beginning. And renew a, a steadfast fear, a spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence 
and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. He's talking about the murder there. The God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your pleasure to Zion. Zion is Israel. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. They shall offer bulls on your altar and everything will be back to normal. Everything will be all right. All right, let's break this down a little bit at a time and we'll see what we can get. You'll see though that in this Psalm, in this prayer, David shows humility, honesty, God's grace, transparency, a change of life, thought, action, and attitude, a trust, an urgency, and a resolve. All these elements of true repentance are found in Psalm 51. Oh, yes, and of course, sincerity and not a superficial sorrow. David was truly sorry for his sins, and that comes from Joel chapter 213, which I've neglected to read. Rend your heart and not your garments. In other words, tear up your heart in sorrow. Return to your Lord, the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Well, thank God for that. All right, let's break it down. Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. How does God show us his loving kindness towards our sin? Anyone? How does God show his loving kindness towards our sin? Sister Soon, if you can answer, I'm asking you. And if you're at work, that's okay too. <laughs> she said she's at work in the comments. All right, Caroline, you answer it. How, is, how does God show our, his loving kindness towards us in our sin? Well, the fact that he doesn't punish us because Jesus took the punishment for us and that uh, he instead gives us what because if we when we repent and and uh, ask for forgiveness, then he replaces um our sinful nature with his righteousness and then he he considers us as his own children so the fact that he takes us into his fold into the family and then he even blesses us as his own children that's just the amazing grace of god and uh, joseph do we deserve this kind of love and tender mercy uh, there's uh there's no criteria there at all for us to you know or we don't uh, oh, God doesn't owe us anything at all. Um, but because of his tender mercies, we're, we're able to, to come before his throne of grace and to receive uh, mercies and, and forgiveness. And that's why it's sometimes for, for other people, they find it really hard to believe that there is really somebody who can do this because as far as they're concerned, you know, like when you consider yourself a sinner, you you seem to uh, pro project yourself up upwards in such a way that nobody can, um, you know, you you look like uh, you're on top of a pedestal that even God doesn't matter anymore. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that answer. Let's move on to the next section. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. This is a perfect outline of what constitutes confession. Can you tell me what the elements of true confession are? We looked at true repentance, but here you will find true confession. So looking at this passage, tell me some of the things that you see that are elements of true confession anyone acknowledging your realization of your own sin but also acknowledging who god is okay so acknowledging your sin for what it actually is there it is there and also acknowledging who god is and in verse four this is how we are to acknowledge god what does this mean that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge 
That's a part of confession too. And what, what would that verse tell you about how we should relate to God when we confess? He is 100% right. Is, say that again. He's 100% right in the way he judges us. That's right. He's 100% right in the way he judges us. And that our sin actually is sin. It's not weakness. It's not human frailty. It's not all oh, because we were tired or because we had a hard day. Our sin is sin. Our sin is rebellion against God and it's disobedience of his word. And we are right to confess that we are sinners and we are right to go before God. We are right to call our sin sin and not something else because whatever God says is sin is sin and he is just in everything that he does. Is there anything else you see about confession in that passage? Anything else? What about this one? What kind of a confession is that? We've acknowledged that we are sinners. We haven't tried to sugarcoat it. That's part of confession. We've acknowledged that God is just and that he is right in calling our sin a sin. One more thing to do, and it's right here in verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What element of confession is that? Anyone? I feel like this is kind of talking on changing the direction. So uh, when it says, you know, wash me thoroughly and cleanse me, it's really getting away, getting rid of that sin. And I think in with the with the thought in, in mind that you're not going to head back to it, that you're not going to make yourself dirty again. So that change in direction that we were talking about. Okay, change of direction. Anything else? Wash me thoroughly from my sin and cleanse me or from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What else, What other kind of confession is that? You're confessing something when you say that. What is it that you're confessing? When you're telling God, wash me and cleanse me. What are you saying? And your sin is dirty. Yeah, you are saying that, but you're saying something else. You're saying something about God. He is pure. Something more. He's all powerful. Tom, what are we saying in verse 2? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What am I acknowledging? Oh, here we go. He's the only one that can wash us from our sin. That's the, what I'm looking for. He's the only one. We're confessing that he is the only one that can wash us from our sin. There's nothing that we can do to attain or earn or perform to gain forgiveness. Okay, let's move on to the next section. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is where the concept of original sin comes. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. That's talking about the condition of our spirit. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. I want to key on that section. The bones that you have broken may rejoice. How does sin hurt us? And where does sin live? That's what this passage tells you. Where does sin live? Let's start with that one. I talked about this on Sunday. If you if you listen to the message on Sunday, you'd know the answer to this. Where is sin? Where is our sin nature? Where is it, where can you find it? Anyone? Oh, you weren't listening on Sunday. Where is the sin? Where does the sin nature live, everybody? In our heart. Not in our hearts. No. In our minds. Not in our well, yeah, in our minds and in our hearts, yeah. But basically, where does it live? Where does Paul say it lives? Romans flesh? where in our flesh the soul the flesh that said in the body of sin it lives in our body i said on sunday that the sin nature is weaved into every cell into every muscle into every fiber and as long as we are in this body we're going to be dealing with our sin nature all of our lives but thank god he's given us a new nature which lives in our spirit it brings our spirit back to life that new nature is the holy spirit himself and he makes us alive to god and gives us the power to be able to put our flesh, our body, our sin nature to death. And that's what that verse acknowledges. It acknowledges that we have a sin nature because in sin did my mother conceive me. And since I desire truth in the inward part and wisdom in the inward part, that can happen without the spirit of God living in me. And when he does, he will cleanse me from my sins and I will be whiter than snow. How does sin hurt us? 
Well, obviously, there are some consequences related to sin, because David talks about his bones being broken. Now, that's a figurative term, because the bones that are broken could be anything. It could be adversity. It could be sickness. It could be things going wrong in your life. It could be conflict. It could be a whole encyclopedia of problems that are related to hanging on to your sin. But nothing is worse than your body breaking down. And I think this is what David is alluding to here, is that if you hang on to your sin and you don't confess it, the body begins to break down. But when you confess it, as Mark had mentioned before, there's a release and it actually has an effect on your physical body, an actual effect on your physical body. If you look at a picture of me or anybody who is a Christian now before they were saved and you look at me at a, a picture of me now, you'll see a big difference in my face. It's almost like glowing. All right. Hide me, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit or a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, the reason that David prayed that is because he was not a New Testament Christian. Once you have the spirit of God in you, nobody's going to take it away. But in those days, as I said, the spirit came and went. So David is praying, please don't take your favor away from me. And so he was praying in the context of the old covenant. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. That applies to us. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. This passage captures the feelings of a righteous person who knows they have sinned and their fears. Can you point them out? So when you've sinned, how do you feel? This passage will tell you. Anyone? Now, we're not going to lose the Holy Spirit. That's the one thing that I have to comment on. But the other feelings are all real. So what is it that we feel when we are in sin and the Spirit of God convicts us? Guilty. Guilt is one of them. Yeah. Anything else? Look at the passage. It'll tell you. Feel dirty. Feel dirty. Yeah. Dirty, guilty. Anything else? You feel far from God. So that's why he says, uh, don't cast away your presence, because he was already feeling that separation. That's right. You feel a separation from the presence of God. Even though you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit will not leave you, there's still a sense of separation from God. Is there anything else before we move on? Christina, do you see anything else in there? Can you put up the scripture on the screen again? Yeah, sure. Just a second. Here. <clears throat> Here it is. Can I just say something in the meantime? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I think as Christians, as New Testament Christians, we can actually grieve the spirit. That's right. Within us. Yeah, we can grieve him and we know we've grieved him and we want to restore that relationship with him, which is what we have here. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Maybe, Christina, you can elaborate. That's exactly what I was looking at right now. Yeah, maybe. That feeling of that separation from God and you're feeling guilty and disgusting and you're just like, oh, like, where's that joy of my salvation, that joy of just being with you, Lord, and that closeness that we had, like, restore that to me because I can't do it myself. Okay, so that pretty well summarizes true repentance. Now, here's a question. Did God forgive David, and will he forgive you if you pray that kind of a prayer? Anyone? Can we trust God to forgive us? Yes. The answer is absolutely yes. So let's see how he forgave David, which is coming up in the subsequent passages. All right, let's go down here. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God and the uh, God of my salvation. And then my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. For the offerings or the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These things, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, they shall offer bulls on your altar. That definitely speaks of restoration in an Old Testament context. So yes, Jesus or God really did forgive David. And that was before Jesus died on the cross for anybody's sins. So he will definitely forgive you. My last two questions are, what is a broken spirit? And what is a contrite heart? Let's start with broken spirit. Kofi, what is a broken spirit?
a spirit that is separated from the spirit of God. Okay. And in what sense is it broken? Well, it, it, looking at looking at it from a, a Christian, you know, yeah, Christian perspective. That's what we're perspective. Looking. It's it's. I think you know we we would experience it a little differently from you know uh, the old covenant because you know once you are given life by the Spirit of God. Um, your spirit is alive. You are. Right. You have life. That's right. Um, so uh, a broken spirit is one that um, I would say is not in step with the spirit of God. There is a, a you know uh, a misalignment. I'll say. Okay. Um, like between a... your spirit and the spirit of God, and you feel that that separation. You don't feel um you know i don't know how to describe it but when okay. when i am in a, in a funk for example okay you know um i know that i am not in right step with the spirit of god um yeah okay i got it uh, I, I guess i would describe it as an electric wire being cut and the current is not working there's one illustration or a phone line being cut off there's another illustration or uh, a source of energy or a source of power being cut off from a particular object or thing. And in our case, the spirit of God, this relationship we have with the spirit has been altered and has been damaged and needs to be repaired through repentance. And Daniel Servino, what is a contrite, a broken spirit and a contrite heart? What is a contrite heart, Daniel? Honestly, I'm not sure what contrite means. <laughs> well, you try to figure it out. Broken spirit, contrite heart. What does that say to you in general? These oh, things sure. God will not despise. Um, I would say like basically everything that we've been through, like, well, that we've gone over in this Bible study, like repentance and like uh, a heart that really does mean to repent. And like, uh, how you say, not just like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. And then you turn around two seconds later and you go back to doing what you're doing. That's exactly what a contrite heart is, a heart that is humble, a heart that is transparent, a heart that is honest, a heart that has an urgency, a heart that trusts in God. All the things that we've mentioned up to now about true repentance are involved in a contrite heart. Very good. And I have one. And a heart, that's, a heart that's undivided. Undivided is very important, too, because he was mentioning how young people are very divided. Uh, can we add uh, remorseful as well? Yes, remorseful, definitely. So agree or disagree true repentance is pleasing to god and always receives total mercy yes or no yes yes anybody else just say yes or no yep yes yes yes, yes. Well, that's, that's very important especially if you're dealing with a recurring sin like pornography like gluttony like anxiety like fear the ones that keep coming back and keep coming back just keep confessing keep turning to christ Keep trusting in God. Keep re keep the repentance, the flow of repentance going. Keep trusting in Him to change you, and He will change you. Believe me, He will. He will empower you to have to have dominion over that sin and to have control over your life. And with that, we close. So I'm going to ask Mark Zarbatani to close in prayer. Thanks, everybody. Mark, dear Lord, we thank you for what we've learned here today. Uh, and for many of us, a reminder that true repentance is what is required of you. Lord, you died for us. You died in our place. And Lord, you gave us salvation and eternal life as a result of your death and resurrection. So, Father, I just pray that you look into each one's heart as we pray here tonight. And Father, if there be any wicked way within us, that first of all, you point it out to us, Lord, that we stop concealing that. You point it out to us. And that, Father, you bring us to a place where we can repent of that sin that is within each one of us. And in doing so, I pray that you would cleanse us, that you would wash us, that you would purify us, 
And that, Lord, that we would never look back because true repentance is a change of mind and a change of heart. And, Lord, getting a hold of our emotions, I believe that that is important as well. And so, Father, we thank you for what we've learned through David's experience. We thank you for Psalm 51. We thank you for everything that we've heard in, in regards to the characteristic of true repentance. And thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness, that you forgive, you forgive us and you forgive us again. Lord, and you, you help us, you strengthen us, you build us up. We fall down, but you lift us up. And Lord, you place us, you place us on higher ground. So Father, continue to work in each person's life here. Thank you for the leadership of this study. And I thank you for what you will create as a result of this study. We bless you. We thank you. We give you glory in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The Bible study will be posted tomorrow on the Love Project and on the House Montreal. I'll also send it to you personally because I think this is a Bible study that you'll want to go back and listen to again. And I'll, I've already sent the notes to some people. One last thing before we go. Today is Kofi's birthday. Well, I'm gonna sing. We're going to sing happy birthday to him. Get ready, Caroline. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. It's so funny that one is saying it at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, there's always a few milliseconds delay. I will give Kofi a, an, an opportunity to respond. Kofi, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. And you don't look a day over 40. Yeah. How old are you actually? 37. Congratulations. Congratulations. Wow. Many happy returns. Many, many more Bye. years to come. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.